And welcome to another 2007 Time Capsule PC video, this time doing something special. We've done this before, but not with this generation. Here we're looking at Dead Space, a game from 2008 running on the 2007 PC and, most importantly, on an Xbox 360 as I'm joined by my friend and colleague, John Lemon. How are you doing there, John? That's right. The Xbox San Dokumaru is ready to go. <laughs> and we're playing some Dead Space on it. Uh, because I think the game was first architected on the Xbox 360, so it only seemed like the natural version to play. And I guess this kind of comes in the wake of the recent announcements regarding the franchise. And yeah, but we're not alone, are we? No, we're not. We're also joined by Audi Surly, our good friend and colleague over there. How you doing there, Audi? How's it going there, Alex? I think this is our first official video together. Of this type? Yeah, I mean, we've been in uh, DF Direct Weeklies together, but not in an actual kind of, like, game video like this, no. Yeah, the Directs aren't canon, though. <laughs> no, they're extended universe. <laughs> they're going to get rid of those soon enough. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here, though, because this is a game I really enjoy. Uh, I'm not playing any version, though. I do have it on PS3, but the PS3 has HDCP. And you didn't have a way to strip it out, unfortunately. And not overnight. Unfortunately, no. So I guess we're going to do like we did with Splinter Cell, right, Alex? Where it's kind of like, I'm playing here on 360, you're playing on PC. We can kind of uh, compare and contrast together in real time. And I think you're using, actually, a period-appropriate PC. Is that right? For sure, yeah. It's a PC, essentially, an 8800 GT and a Q6600 all running actually Vist Windows Vista, so that's period correct too, but this PC is not one that came out in the year that this game came out, 2008. This is one year older, but as you can see already, I think it's running rather amazingly, so it's not really that big of a deal. <laughs> that's right. Oh, and things are about to go down here. This game, you know, for being, um, you know, it is a survival, well, not survival horror necessarily in the strictest sense of the word, but you know, it's a horror game. Uh, it gets right to business really, really, really quickly. It doesn't I, actually have a slower buildup. I, I like the way they... So one of the things I like about this game is that it kind of does that... It, it kind of keeps cuts to a minimum. Mm -hmm. uh, like, you see right here during this introduction cutscene, uh, yeah, there's some stuff like the flashing screen. There was that initial introduction. But by and large, they try to keep the camera in the perspective similar to what you would use during gameplay. Mm -hmm. Occasionally rotating it around it kind of reminds me of the more recent god of war game in that sense yeah it uh, is and they were doing something similar not exactly but similar all the way back during this period yeah i think alex when you say survival horror yeah, it's maybe not that but it's atmospheric horror and i think uh that was what really made this so powerful to me especially because the uh, like john says the lack of cuts just immersion that's on display in this game was unlike anything prior to it yeah, the oh, yeah. including the uh, the in world stuff. Like you yeah. can see his health bar filling up on the back, and like all the menus and everything. Everything is completely in world, which was really fresh oh, and new. Totally. I mean, uh, yeah. I mentioned on retros and stuff that uh, you know I come from the school of uh, another world, which is a game that thrusts you into <laughs> basically a scenario with no HUD elements, uh, no ammo, no score, no nothing. It's basically just you and the game. And I think Dead Space kind of follows in that i don't know if it's directly inspired by but there is no video game layer basically to this game other than like the few things here that you can see time perfectly as i say that uh but for the most part <laughs> the game uh doesn't have that separation layer of a video game between you and isaac so you don't really have anywhere to hide your focus you have to focus on your avatar in the game and as we will talk more about, just the atmosphere of the game draws you in. And it's uh, probably, for me, was the strongest introduction to this next-gen era that I had on this hardware at the time. Oh, it was amazing. Wow, that's, that's quite a lot to, to say. I, I guess I can see what you mean. So for me, it's interesting. I do like the game a lot, but I did have some disappointments with it because... Um, I had previously loved the System Shock series yeah. and was kind of expecting and hoping that it would be sort of like a spiritual follow-up to that. And in some ways, 
you get that, but in other ways it's not quite there. But it is still, uh, it's a fun game, and mm-hmm. it's got some amazing environments to explore. And you know, for 2008, this tech was really solid too, actually. Yeah, <laughs> we're just looking at it right now. Like we're in this area. Yeah, let me come uh, over and out. We can compare a little bit here. Yeah, let's. Uh, yeah, let's take a just look at the like even the shadow maps. I'm pretty sure they should be pretty comparable if we get close to the wall here, like just like right here, like if you can get a little bit closer and then to the left a bit. So yeah, we can already see one of the like the differences is that the the shadow map filtering and the shadows are just like slightly lower res here on on Xbox 360. To to put everything out there, I'm playing the game at 1920 by 1080, uh, which you know full HD in 2008 is pretty awesome, I think. And also um, the highest graphical settings, including the anti-aliasing, which we'll talk about later. But you know, real time shadow maps, the game is primarily driven by them. I'd say that's a little bit on the rarer side for around 2008, John. What would you say? Let's go inside here. Yeah, I mean, they were kind of going for the Doom 3 aesthetic, but not quite. Like, the way they handle textures and such is quite different. But um, it is kind of going for that. And I actually... So I think this is a good example of, of targeting that generation of consoles right in the sense that it does run at a very stable 30 frames per second. Uh, and you get smooth performance on both Xbox 360 and PS3 and PC, of course, uh, which is something that you could not take for granted last no. gen or Th- two gens it. ago, actually. This, this is around that time there was like Unreal Engine 3 games coming out the wazoo and, you know, they were just kind of really stuttery games, usually on average, I would say. Yeah, they were. And this was, you know, very, very smooth, uh, both on PC and, like you said, Xbox 360. Now, John, you mentioned, you know, the frame rate here, and I have a question for you because I know that you, of course, like your gaming in six frames per second, but do you think this type of game, it doesn't really hurt at 30 frames? The... No, it's more that it's it's a consistent 30, and that's what matters. Uh, because back at, during this generation, one of the big problems was that um, a lot of games were not. You know, it was actually relatively uncommon to have a stable 30 uh, for a big game release this generation. Oh, completely. Especially on PS3, which was just off, often rather yeah. dire, to say the least. Uh, so this was kind of a, a welcome change of pace for everyone. It was a solid experience no matter where you played it. Yeah, I've only played this on PS3 uh, back then. Uh, it's been quite a while since I played this, um, but I'm watching the PC version primarily here for this stream, and I'm actually quite blown away. You said this was one year after the release that your hardware is basically targeting, Alex? Yeah. So the thing, the 8800 GT and Q6600 are interesting because uh, they came out, you know, 2007. Uh, the 8800 GT, the graphics card here, is based upon an architecture that actually came out in 2006. But it was one of the first times in a while that there was an amazing price performance uh, ratio vis a vis the consoles. Uh, so, like, the 8800 GT is easily more yeah. than two times as powerful as the, the GPU in the Xbox 360. Easily. Uh, uh, so, that's why you can get this amazing image quality and performance on this game, on this hardware, even though it's, you know, technically old by the time this game came out. Uh, so it's it's just really an interesting time period where if you were on PC here, you were getting some really, really awesome ports for games uh, and like the premier way to play. Oh gosh, let's run out of here. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> uh, it, as it starts, you know, like, like I was saying, this game does oh, wait, not wait. waste its time um, at all waiting for the horror to ratchet up. It, it goes straight for the jugular right away. And we're about to have so. this amazing a, scene here. So me, that's actually maybe something I would I would critique about it is that um, I never actually found this game to be especially like scary, oh. which is not a bad thing. Like the game here is very well done, but uh, I was really into like yeah. horror games back then, especially, and I always felt that this didn't quite it didn't quite instill that sense of terror that the best horror games hmm. kind of I'm, I'm, did for me but also horror is something that's very subjective so, so it is a definitely it is subjective because what scares people can be vastly different things uh but i'm curious uh back then at least what how did you play this game were you fully settled in with a sound system and all that or did you primarily yeah i had a 5.1 surround system on huh. a 50 inch play because I would slightly disagree with you in the sense that, like, for me, this the type of atmosphere we were seeing here was kind of unlike what I had 
felt from previous generations. You know, Resident Evil 4 is probably, like, a close comparison. See, I wouldn't say... I didn't find Resident Evil 4 that scary. I'm thinking No, more... it's not scary. I don't think it's a scary game. RE4 isn't very scary. I think the Silent Hill <laughs> games had done it really well. Uh, System Shock 2 had done it really well. You know, but Siren had done it well. What I mean is more like the perspective you, of how you're playing the game. You know, the camera and just the general gameplay setup. Uh, that's probably one of the closer ones. Oh. But what was so effective to me regarding this game was the uh, audio tech, the sound design in this game. Oh, the, the yeah, it's the probably the best really uh, of this generation, in my opinion, because the the level and this is uh, something we don't really talk enough about in Digital Foundry, just because it's not visually that interesting to talk about sound. Yeah, you're but right. the sound design in Dead Space was so effective that if you had, like John and I did, like a proper surround sound and you turned off the lights, you sat there, uh, you had a good display, literally the sound would then expand the play field into the room you were sitting in. It was that effective. Because it wasn't just a, you know, sense of like, well, the sound is either behind you or in front of you. It was, it was sneaking up on you at the side. It was, you know, unsettling. It was very much a mix yeah. of kind of like the science fiction uh, dread of like Alien, and then also kind of the soundscape of a Silent Hill, where it's just a lot of sounds and mechanical uh, unease that was kind of filling the room. Yeah, the audio. So, like, one thing I noticed earlier when I was playing this game to preparing for this stream, essentially getting it set up on this PC, was that there was a very cohesive design for all of the... Uh, this is the USG Ishimura we're finding, finding ourselves on, a planet cracker uh, on this system. And all of the... along with the UI branding, but all of the audio branding throughout the entire game, not just, like, the spaceship sounds, but, like, all the UI that pops up, Mm. All has very different sounds, but it's all within like a same sound family. Yep. And it, it, it's just incredible sounding That's right. when you play the game. And I think this is an element that didn't even like transfer that well over to the sequels. I know this isn't about the sequels necessarily, but I didn't find the sound design as effective as That's in true. this first game. No, I think you're right. And I, you know what? I'm just trying to think about other, other good successful horror games that I remember from the last like decade or two. Alien Isolation yeah, also absolutely. springs to mind. It's like a something that sort of captures a similar feel. So uh, I'm gonna try to save here. So this is really awesome technologically right here. This these cutscenes. So like, there's no actually scripted cutscenes in the game in terms of where they usually take away camera control over you. Oh yeah. You can always walk around the environment Half-Life style. Uh, which I really do appreciate, you know, that level of agency they give the character. But here, when you're talking with characters, usually they're somewhere else. They're, you're always disconnected from the other human characters in the game, and they pop up, you know, an artificial reality link or holographic reality in front of the player where they're using video files that are being streamed in there with higher quality character models, yeah. higher quality animation. Very, but the characters over cool. there, you know, they have lower fidelity, uh, but you don't really notice it. Even, you know, I'm playing a game at 1080p here, I still think it, these little cutscenes here are really effective and look excellent. Mm -hmm. They're small enough, too, that it works. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's very effective, I agree. And I'll hope you find Nicole. Thinking about all this, though, I, I think I, I put my finger on, on the, the horror landscape of 2008 and what was going on. Because, you know, even though I was using a plasma, uh, plasmas of that generation and LCDs especially they couldn't quite replicate the black level performance right. of a CRT are you going to save that and <laughs> yeah let's do that i think CRT is specifically the thing that would allow it it helped make horror games scarier by really creating this dark shadowy look mm -hmm. that is hard to match on these flat yeah. panels of the era and so oh, yeah. you got you you kind of lost that like you know, when you're playing Silent Hill and you look down the hallway in a CRT, you can't really see what's down there. It just looks yeah. like darkness. Uh, but on an LCD or something, and even a plasma, it looks like this gray. is a. I mean, horror you know I mean? of this time uh, in film as well had a similar issue that, as we jump to HD, 
uh, things became too clean and things became became too apparent because on a CRT you have a natural noise and as you mentioned deeper blacks uh, and the kind of like a grain that goes over the entire screen and it helps mask yeah. effects it helps increase atmosphere and um, you know at this time I think horror primarily in the mainstream because we you know this was still an era of like scary movie and whatnot and so yeah it was you know what was scary to people only three years ago was now comedy <laughs> so video games were much better at adapting horror for an hg generation and you know this is a huge stepping stone right. in that um, evolution yeah that's for sure oh, we have to go in the other direction uh, i actually it. forget where to go from here um because we can't hear the audio so, so there's <laughs> always at least on pc there's there's some amazing um you know diegetic ui right elements here. but you can always one you can hit let's talk about a bit about the ui and stop here for a second you can always stop and get a way marker in the world that projects holographic stuff or you know there's the map oh yeah and the map is actually genius <laughs> it's you know projected right in front of isaac it's here, in world and it's yeah. in world and mm -hmm. it actually has 3d elements kind of like the doom 3d auto map that we saw in doom eternal inside this ui you also have your inventory or yep. uh, metroid prime or metroid prime uh you also have your inventory here, and there's a lot of things that they did to just make it seem like it's actually in the world. Like, actually, every single time you move along the inventory, yeah. Isaac's head follows where you're pointing and things like that. Like, he's actually looking oh, yeah, at these things so cool. with you, and it's incredibly cool. There's no reason for them to have done that other than to, once again, convince you the fact that you're not a UI camera in front of things, but you're actually following Isaac through this world. I think that they did that really effectively throughout the entire game. It's pure Im immersion. There's a, there's a lot I think that they did here too. Um, just not just in terms it, of UI. It, it the feels very as well. bespoke. Uh, well, then, mm -hmm. Let's I, put the ping up. So. The first bespoke. <laughs> it's in the video. <laughs> <laughs> it's in there. But uh, oh, in the here and now, there's I noticed, a... noticed one thing earlier, and that was uh, you know the physics and just the targeting system of this game because the way you take mm -hmm. out enemies uh, depends on where you shoot them. And this is another thing that made the game scarier to me, was the fact that you had to be calculated a little bit in how you approach these pretty disgusting, you know, fast creatures <laughs> yes. uh, that came straight at you. And uh, it unsettles you and it takes you off your guard. And as the game progresses though, of course, you get better, you settle down. And that's something that they took into account because I think the game starts with a lot of jump scares, as I remember at least. But over time, as you get better, mm -hmm. the game yeah. doesn't really jump at you anymore because you are more secure in yourself. You're more familiar with the situation and as such the game then increases more. Uh, puzzles and other atmospheric elements to the gameplay and again it's just such great game design and you know it has that satisfying thing that I like in a lot of games where uh, it's sort of a large yeah. interconnected world you can mm -hmm. end up crisscrossing around and doubling back on places you've been and uh, you know going to new floors and I feel like that's really an immersive design I mean that's you know classic system shock style in fact uh, but also like Metroid and the like. I think that is the design history of this game, though, where it started off at EA with uh, Glenn Schofield. Schofield, I think is his name, uh, working on this game and like Schofield, prototyping it. Uh, yeah, maybe a Schof. I don't know how he actually pronounces it. Um, but oh, uh, prototyping this game around dark. 2005, and I think the idea behind it was he was heavily inspired by Resident Evil, but EA obviously had, this, at this point in time, I'm pretty sure the System Shock mm. license, right? So, so uh, it was like, what do we take this game? What direction? Gosh, yeah. Here you have to navigate via your uh, flashlight yeah, really quickly. Come, out, come back out there and turn around and look down that hallway again at that <laughs> lovely orange glow. Oh, yeah. From the light, the light glare. Ooh, yeah. This game obviously doesn't have any real-time like volumetrics or things like that but nope they love lens flares but they sure they sure fake it nicely <laughs> still a lot of really nice visual it's uh oh, yeah. still rather excellent totally. looking oh this i see where you're at yeah 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 uh, let's uh we so to we gotta go way. this way yeah, look at that oh but there's you know horror bathrooms <laughs> Horror bathrooms. <laughs> yeah. uh, yep. 
Horror bathrooms are definitely a thing. It's like the initial moment of Doom 3. I always, I just like Actually, okay, that. when you come in this room, this room seems very Doom 3. Do you remember that one area where there's that little bridge over the, uh... Oh, yeah. Uh, you walk in there, you walk up over this oh, little yeah, ramp and yeah. bridge thing, and there's like a, some kind of device here. It's very Doom 3. Here's our oh, first larger attached. combat scenario oh, okay. as so well, too. we have too. to do that, uh... Stasis it. Do I have the stasis? Yeah. Yeah. We're playing on easy right now, so uh, the, the enemies technically do take usually a couple more shots to uh, prevent them from moving mm -hmm. in higher difficulties, I'm pretty sure. So it's a little actually, bit easy right now. So so I've maintained that um, enemies that take too many shots actually tends to yeah. make games less oh, scary. Oh, you're totally right. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is that they end up on screen mm -hmm. more often and for longer periods of time, which means you get to see them up close more often and you sort of desensitize yourself to it. So it can be more challenging, but it actually. But loses that's where some the fear. strategic element of uh, you know limbs and stuff comes in, though, because te technically mm -hmm. that's uh, what's supposed to make this scary. Is just you you have to figure out naturally in game how to take these guys out. So you need that time. But I do agree with you overall. But the, I mean the creature designs though were. Wait, what? What? There's a malfunction on that. What? What do we do? You have oh, to. Uh, oh wait. Right. Yeah. Be careful <laughs> with the guy. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You have to stasis it, and then uh, what, after you've put it out there, you have to stasis it so it sticks there very quickly. Oh. Oh god. Here I am. Oh yeah. Attention. I'm getting. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Let's shoot off his leg. But, but yeah, the, oh, the creature this. designs in this game also is a notch above most other horror games at the time because <laughs> I think it's awesome, man. Yeah, what else? What else was was kind of a big horror game in 2008? You know, period? Uh, the Silent Hills remake thing that came out in 2008. I don't know. Well, the the Silent Hill stuff during this period was not great. It was all shifted to Western development teams, and I think some of it um, is pretty okay. You know, some of it's okay, but. Downpour is like pretty downpour. good, and Shattered uh, Memories is uh, quite I, good. I don't... Shattered Memories yeah, was, yeah. was interesting, uh, although artistically, I don't think it's great. But um, Homecoming, I really yeah, don't that, think Yeah, that's you're right about. Um, no, I mean, horror games... Uh, one of the reasons why this was so powerful to me was that horror games, primarily on the PS2, I think, uh, used mechanics that were similar to like PS1 horror games. Not all of them, necessarily, but a lot of yes. them mechanically yeah. operated on the same uh, level and the same way. The graphical fidelity and whatnot was, of course, much better on PS2 than PS1. But in terms of innovation, it wasn't they much similar, to be yeah. seen until, of course, RE4, which is more of an action game. But, you know, that was the Super Mario 64 of its era, basically, RE4. And then you get, like, Gears and whatnot after that. So it kind of goes away, you know, the horror. Uh, aspect because people like the action aspect better and then you come to dead space and you get this incredible reintroduction of atmosphere and actual unease because that was one thing that re4 did didn't there's elements of it but primarily whatever unease you have gets taken away by being the absolute badass you know by leon somersaulting and yeah. suplexing <laughs> monks so oh, yeah. you, know, <laughs> you know you you're too superhuman whereas uh you know uh, one game we haven't mentioned yet that i you know wasn't a game i played a lot but i would say it probably has some influence would be half-life oh maybe so oh this is uh you know they d directly rec say half-life 2 was a main inspiration behind this game with the way Isaac is, he's just an engineer. He doesn't talk at all ever yeah, yeah, in this right. game as well. So you know, oh yeah, they have a very similar kind of train car introduction. Yeah, I mean it's not the exact same, but you know, everyone's walking on the shoulders of giants. The concept is well, yeah. that's yeah. Uh, so. One thing you're talking about uh, that I find very interesting is that you know, Resident Evil Four uh, gave you more of an action experience than previous Resident Evils, and part of that is the change of camera angles and also the way... Um, it, was a, it was a huge shift yeah. in a very different direction. Your character moves, but in this game, I feel like you're slightly more vulnerable at times in this game, even though you technically have you have technically more control over Isaac than you have over Leon. Like, for example, in this game, you can move while you have your sights up, you know? Yeah. Like, that's not in Resident Evil 4 at all. And that was a big thing. At the thing. same time, <laughs> due to the way... Enemies, you know, you're less effective in close combat in this game. Let, though, let's sure. not, let's not, let's not say. I wouldn't say that's a, that's a, a not negative. Thing, no, no, uh, no negatives well at all. I mean, that's how the game uh, yes, plays laid up. It is true. You know, enemies and routing yeah. is 
it's meant for you to stop and aim at them. So that's actually one thing that this game kind of falls short on, I think, compared to Resident Evil 4, is generally like enemy reaction. Yeah. Uh, it's not quite as engaging, but it is good. Yeah. Uh, I sound like I'm being a little bit harsh on this, I guess, but I do like it. I think well, it's a good someone game. Someone has to be the bad but, cop. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I do. I would say that this this was a very very bright period for EA. Yes. The fact that this and Mirror's Edge basically hit around the same time was unbelievable. Uh, it was such a like it feels like a, an era that will probably never exist again for EA, and that really makes me sad. Yeah, for EA maybe not. Let's talk a bit about about why we're doing this event. What's though, that right? This video, I mean, they announced a remake of this game. That's true. But obviously, with not the same developers, this was EA Red Shore, I believe. Wait, which you're saying visceral. remake, but uh, it's, not, it's reimagining, right? Uh, yeah, I guess yeah. Is, that's the word to use. To me, every remake is a reimagining <laughs> anyway, since it's not the same. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, well, there's like the remake, there's the remaster, and the re reimagining. Yeah, they are. They can be different. Like, I would say Resident Evil 2 remake. Uh, well, actually, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Then, what's the difference between a reimagining and a remake? Like, RE2, for instance, is yeah, very different from. You know, I think that is a reimagining. It feels I don't like think it could that's be a either. remake. I think that's a reimagining that takes the. Yeah. For me, a reimagining is taking the potential and the kind of foundation of the original property and then taking it further, taking it in different directions to explore it, whereas a remaster is, of course, just higher resolutions and whatnot. And a remake is when you re literally remake the game uh, with today's you know tools, but it's essentially the same game. Like, uh, I would say the PS5 launch title Demon's Souls is actually more of a remake. Yes, that's more of a remake. Else. And, yeah. and Resident Evil 2 is more of a reimagining. But people, there, there's, there's so so many arguments over these terms and it ultimately doesn't matter. Well, I'm sure the entire comments field will just argue this now. I cannot believe exactly. Alex just but said we, that. <laughs> we, have, we, have made, we have declared that this is how it is. This is the way. Therefore, you must live with it. Can I just yes, say, though, that way. this room is awesome? Uh, I remember loving this room back in the day. It's like oh, having yeah. a large piece of machinery that's shadow casting sort of swinging back there. And I also love the fake volumetric lights where it's got like these like you know, they lined it up. It's just like sprites or whatever. It just kind of hung there in a way. It, but it's actually like reasonably convincing, you know, especially for the time. It, it, it looks feels good. feels very inspired by Nostromo. Oh, yeah. yeah. But even though, you know, Nostromo for sure, but at the time period, I'm pretty sure uh, Ars Technica's interviews uh, with Glenn confirmed this pretty easily. But their, one of their main inspirations was actually Event Horizon, of all the things. Oh, the Paul Anderson movie? Oh, yeah. The Paul Anderson film, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I know. I like Event Horizon. Uh, it, has, it has its moments. Uh, I, I have mixed feelings on it. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, it's a flawed movie, but I still i have enjoyed it. Yeah. Sam Neill is very good in it. Yes, exactly. He kind of makes S the Sam Neill's great in everything, though. Like most movies he's in. Exactly. Um, but let's talk a bit about the tech here, since this is 2008, and I already mentioned, you know, you know, such a reliance on shadow maps, not super common in this era, always. Um, another thing that's interesting is we're looking at a deferred renderer here, so the, the only anti-aliasing support uh, in this pre-FXAA time was just whatever the developer could think of. And this game on PC and Xbox 360 ships with a quote-unquote anti-aliasing option. I'm going to flash a oh, bit of uh, yeah. comparisons uh, with this on screen right now, but it's not really anti-aliasing. It's kind of like a blur filter uh, that just applies kind of semi-randomly to edges, and it doesn't actually like give the edge a proper no. gradient, uh, but it make just make the game look softer. The thing general. is, is like, uh, this was, I don't know, it's this not was that an interesting game. time period because 2008 was right around the rise of deferred rendering in games when it really started to become more and more popular. And obviously things have evolved from there, and we have some elements of that that are still common today, but there's, there's not that many just complete straight deferred rendering games anymore at this point, I think. Yeah, it's pretty rare. Yeah, yeah. Too, too many drawbacks, but it was, it was pretty awesome because it did allow for, you know, comparatively at the time it allowed for a lot of dynamic lights, uh, which wasn't really something that could have been done in a forward render on that hardware especially. 
So what's the last big game you can remember using that? Uh, fully deferred. Yeah. Fully deferred. Uh, yeah. Fully deferred. That's pr probably almost none nowadays because they're using some variation yeah. on deferred. That's like tile deferred. Mm. Tile deferred and all this. Yeah, some elements are still done using deferred today, but mm. not you know, not like this where it's mostly completely deferred. Yeah. It's just like deferred rendering uh, has its problem with like higher resolutions and things like that and material yeah, diversity. Yeah. One thing you'll see in this game, for example, is that uh, I really think it is technically awesome. But if you look around the environment, a lot of the materials do look rather, rather samey. Uh, it's not, you know, doing a ton of different material stuff. That's one thing that deferred rendering kind of locks you into a bit. Yeah. Okay. Wow. I want to see. I want to see their G buffer for this game. <laughs> I wonder if they got a fat G buffer. Show in me there. your G buffer. Is that what you tell people? Yeah. <laughs> Show me your fat G buffer. That's what John has on his oh T-shirt. Oh my gosh. Show me that fat G buffer. <laughs> okay, this is cool. So, <laughs> they, you know, you were talking about them empowering you throughout the game, uh, using less jump scares over time. Part of that is just making Isaac more powerful. Uh, throughout the yeah. game, you have a slight yeah. upgrade system. I always upgraded my rig first. I'm pretty sure because I was. By the way, afraid this type of thing is still very me. common in modern games. Like you know, you play something like The Last of Us mm. it has exactly the same kind of thing. You walk up to a table, a menu pops up, never cuts. You just like doing <laughs> upgrades. Yeah, dude, look at the depth of field here, though. I actually think it's kind of amazing looking for a game from. Uh, oh this yeah, time like period. the like, close-up stuff. It almost has a like bokeh-like shape. Yeah, I was gonna say to right. It. That's really interesting. Actually, though. That is it, pretty it awesome. It looks more here. like a PS2 era depth of field. Cuz PS2 stuff looked a lot more like that where it kind of had this like weird kind of it's hard to explain, but you know, you get that kind of blur effect but then the edges were still super sharp like that and it kind of had like a weird pattern within the ins within the surface. Uh, but I yeah, think I mean, it's just you know. because there was no way to like, yeah, there was no really good cheap way to uh, like this is running at 60 FPS on a 1080p on an 8800GC. <laughs> so the, the, it's a little bit rudimentary Can I just say, in terms of some of the way it works. I, I miss, I, I miss the sign of diversity and rendering features, you know, where you play games and mm -hmm. there's a lot of unique engines out there and uh, lots of different implementations to do things. People are figuring it out. And I actually like that. Like, I think it's cool to see all these unique solutions. Oh, yeah. It was an awesome time. Uh, it does feel like we're getting, you know, there's a lot more stuff feels standardized these days. It's like people discover sort of a best practices approach to something. Yeah. And then you start seeing similar results elsewhere. It gets too streamlined. I understand the purpose of that. but Yeah, you know. th that's why I'm hoping the ray tracing stuff, uh, you know... Well, is we're already seeing some really different ray tracing implementations in games. Hmm. Oh my gosh! Uh, I'll just <laughs> shot oh. off his head. <laughs> well, they tell um, you not to do that. God, <laughs> that is like, <laughs> um, yeah, they tell you don't do that. I do love the stomp animation, by the way. Just like, and then all yes. the guts spilling around. Oh, it's so good. Maybe they should have gotten stomp to do the soundtrack. <laughs> oh no! Stomp on the soundtrack. <laughs> 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 now we have to cut it from the footage. What was the Bob's Burger parody of that again? It's a clap or something? <laughs> it's, oh, is it like called the clap or something? Which is something completely different, of course. Um, it's something oh. like that where they just clap hands instead of stomping. Oh, yeah. We're, we're totally off base. Am I going the right way? Okay. Yeah, you're going the right way. I'm yes, waiting for you at the okay. top. It's like we're playing okay. co-op, but we're not in the yeah, same yeah. world. I love it. Right. Watch out for the yep, take co -op, him out. Co-op could work definitely in Dead Space, and it did technically come out in Dead Space 3. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, so one of the last things I did before moving to Europe was playing through Dead Space 3 with my uh, younger sister, actually, because huh? we, we had played through all these games together of being both fans of horror games at the time. And uh, I mm. we had a, you know, Dead Space 3 was divisive, but because we played the entire thing in co-op, it was actually pretty memorable. I had a great time with it. That's probably what they meant, maybe. You know, for it to be shared that way, so it yeah. is more memorable. I should mention a bit what happened to this studio. So Red Shore uh, became Visceral. Yep. Then they worked on, you know, 
Dead Space 2. They also worked on some other games like Dante's Inferno using this same engine. Mm -hmm. uh, but by the time, but that was a 60 FPS yeah. game, interestingly. Um, but by the time, um, I've put this in this machine over here. By the time uh, Dead Space 3 came around, it was critically less successful, uh, I would say, and also probably monetarily less successful. And then instead of working on, I would say, games unique in this, you know, the, the realm of the EA catalog of games, they were kind of flipped over to just, you know, working on Battlefield, essentially. And they made Battlefield Hardline. Uh, I never played that game, so I don't really have any commentary on it, but I don't, it's not a game I probably would ever play. Uh, and then they were just kind of sacked and uh, thrown into the garbage in 2017. Uh, they were working on a Amy Hennig helmed title uh, that was Star Wars. It was essentially going to be Uncharted Star Wars, as far as I know. Um, so that's what happened to this studio, yes. and it's a, it is kind of, it's a bit sad. It's a bit sad. Very sad. That very it sad, sad, considering the talent and just the potential of them. And I was going to ask you guys, actually, towards the end, but you know what happened here because Dead Space I think as this came out as this had success the very first game this is a game that came with uh, a lot of lore and backstory already in it you know you you step into a world that has been worn out already and you know lived in which is so effective and I think there was like uh, even uh, comic book writers like uh, Warren Ellis they also did an animated it. feature there was um, the animated feature, the Wii and then game came the Wii out. Wii game extraction. Yeah, which was great. It was. Uh, that was good. In the lead up to this game's release, there was also an animated comic uh, that they were putting out online and like publishing via game there trailers. Was lots of comics. Uh, that I'm showing on screen here. Yeah, there's because a lot of stuff that they did. The world was set up for this, for it to become a franchise. And I would say at the time, you know, 2008, 2009, this was on trajectory to become sort of the next. Resident Evil sized horror property because Resident Evil at the time was kind of you know just competing with itself it was doing the same thing again with five uh, with some co-op and uh, this was something brand new the atmosphere and the, the lore was so popular and then two s official sequels and nothing I think this is kind of strange and somewhat extreme of a drop-off yeah maybe it just points off to to the way ea was internally managing its ips at this point um you know they technically had mirror's edge which was also could have become its own unique thing over time but they just kind of didn't do anything with it and afterwards you know uh for a long time until mirror's edge catalyst exactly uh so it's uh maybe just internal politics at that point this seems like it should have been even more successful than it was though um because this is awesome. Oh, it, I mean, it was the, the, the weird thing is Dead Space was that successful. It had a few years where it was that successful. And I don't think it really had so much content out there that it was, you know, oversaturated. I wouldn't say that at all. People still to this day want more. Obviously, as we're getting a reimagining. But as, you know, this was also an era where things were beginning, beginning to become expensive to the point where a lot of people couldn't keep up. EA probably could have, but that was using it as an excuse mm -hmm. to just kind of drop things off pretty quickly. So I wonder if just a money thing, straight Gosh, up. Look at this, uh, look at this like rotating light. This is straight out of the end of Aliens, actually right oh, yeah, here. You know, like this is Alien. Yeah, this is just. <laughs> <laughs> that's just Sorry, alien actually yeah the, when they're running around the halls that's alien not aliens right yeah this is, uh, it's too claustrophobic to be aliens because aliens is too open but yeah alien this is uh, very much a sequence out of that so audi is this game better or worse than alien versus predator on the atari jaguar uh oh man what, what a comparison <laughs> can, can they be equal can we just equalize them? So, how about that Jaguar version, Audi? Is it actually pretty good? The Jaguar, uh, Predator, and Alien? Uh, I think for the system it's neat, but it, it just runs so slow. And yeah, it's not actually... It, I, I actually prefer Alien Trilogy on uh, Saturn and PlayStation. And uh, Alien vs. Predator 99. Yeah, that's a completely different game. From the that's actually developer. a good game, yeah. Mind you, but uh, <laughs> it's just dramatically but better. But AVP on the Jag is effectively a Wolfenstein 3D clone. Oh, it absolutely but is it runs a Wolfenstein. 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 Yeah. Uh, but so, as a, 
unrelated to the jag and you know we love talking about the jag here but um i was just like looking at this image quality so i'm capturing this on the 360 in a 1280 by 720 window uh it's a 720p game which is actually a resolution we still see on the switch often and sometimes less and even on on some other platforms occasionally uh but since the rise of modern like TAA and TAAU and all that kind of stuff, I'm you know I I don't know what you think about this, Alex, but I'm kind of of the impression that TAA and all that only really works when your resolution is above a certain threshold. And once you get to 720 mm -hmm. or lower, it actually ends up looking like worse. Like the very raw pixels of this, I feel is actually kind of more attractive. Like there's more shimmering, yeah, but everything just feels a lot sharper. Uh, this looks sharper than your typical 720p Switch game. Yeah, I, I think it really does. It's just the change of technology from then. Uh, you know, the TAA was essentially developed around the time games were starting to target 1080p, and it wasn't really thought of as something that you would use at lower resolution. So I agree with you 100%, and it is almost a shame that the Switch uh, does not sometimes... There's just not, I guess there's just not enough um, impetus, is maybe the word. Maybe that's the wrong word. Uh, to you know, make bespoke renderers for the Switch that rely on something like maybe yeah. MSAA. Uh, that would be interesting. Well, I, some of Nintendo's own games, I guess, actually fall into this where they don't really double down oh. on TAA or anything. So they actually look sharp in the same way. Uh, but a lot of the third-party wow. stuff is very blurry. Anything Unreal Engine. <laughs> uh, the problem, though, is yeah. I understand it. You know, you look totally. at something like, like Doom Eternal or all the Doom ports, and it's like, they look great, but the TAA just makes them look like a blurry mess. But the, part of the problem is that the, the game relies heavily on TAA in general for its effects to work. So if you turn it off, it would just kind of break apart. Uh, and that's just, you know, that's an element of the way modern rendering works now. Because uh, effects rely on that, on using data from multiple so, frames so over a period of time. And without it, it just yeah, you know, it's, the effects break. It, it's sort of interesting though because DLSS is also you know temporal based in a lot of ways, but when its internal res resolution is 720p, it actually still looks really sharp. It's uh, so DLSS breaks the mold. Exactly, DLSS actually does a fantastic job with that. I would say. I love the blue lighting from, you know, I think Isaac is a character model. Oh, yeah. It's just like a triumph. <laughs> it's awesome looking. Like the design of his helmet, uh, his like spinal column uh, being his health meter. Yeah. I'm kind of amazed at how well this game holds up, honestly. Because uh, I hadn't played it for years and it's still like visually attractive. Like it doesn't look ugly. Right? Not at all. Like, a lot of games from this period do look ugly. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah they can be uh, a bit of a blurry eyesore, can't they? But uh, that kind of brings us back to that reimagining because, you know, you could easily just put this on modern consoles with a high resolution and a more steady 60 frames per second frame rate and call it a day. And it's, you know, as I say, it holds up. Gameplay-wise, it holds up. But that's why I think the fact that they're bringing out the reimagining is much more interesting is to just take this concept and like well what can we do with it today and in what direction can we do it with a different set of eyes different set of minds because i've seen some comments saying like you know should just be a remake and things like that but to me that's just never that interesting uh, especially in this era of games where the ones that hold up still holds up so well that this is not a candidate where i would say just like you know I, I don't think just a simple remake or remaster is enough. I think this holds up well enough that you can go back and play it and not really um, suffer too much from it. Yeah, just like Audie's saying, uh, the game still does look amazing today and the imagining reimagining is probably the best way to do this because it you know, if you play it right now on a modern PC, it's super easy to turn this up to 4K60. Almost any PC can do it. In fact, just before making this video with John right here, I was playing it on my PC and I was purposefully making it look even better than the high settings by injecting in things like uh, Pascal Geisha's Wait, uh, SSGI, you know, the Ray Trace GI, Pascal, Pascal Geisha. Oh, perfect. <laughs> this is his name. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, adding in things like a near camera depth of field oh, yeah. to make Isaac look even cooler. 
Uh, and that's kind of like how you can play it nowadays. So I definitely agree with you there, Audi, that there's no reason to just re-release this game and have it be very, very similar. A nice reimagining would be a good way to I think the only thing again. that could be improved by a simple remake would be the physics. Because I think this uses Havoc, right? And, you know, we haven't seen much of the Zero G stuff because that's further out. But, like, uh, maybe that could be implemented better. I don't know. But, uh, yeah. I, yeah, totally I don't have too many that. complaints here overall. Yeah. No. I'm kind of amazed at how well this still holds up, to be honest. It still looks absolutely amazing, but I think here, you know, there's only so much we can say about this game. We could probably talk about it in its sequel, uh, its sequel at some point in the future. And the Wii game. I would love to talk Extraction, about the Wii game. Extraction, right? That's a, it's a pretty yeah, cool game. It's very yeah. good. Also made by yep. Visceral, too. Not farmed out, interestingly enough. And there's that other game, Alex, we talked about on the Direct, right? That's from the original team, I think? The PUBG horror game? Uh, oh, yes. That's uh, made by Glenn Schofield, or Schofield uh, himself taking up the helm on again. Heavily Dead Space inspired. I forget the name of it. I'll post it right now on Poseidon screen. Poseidon effect or something? Yeah, that's, that actually sounds about right. Um... That, but that's right. something we should probably also check out in time when it comes out because I really like this game. I really like the design of it and anything that comes close is a, is good by me. But gentlemen, thank you for talking to me today about Dead Space from 2008. Of course. Thanks for having us. Anytime. And if you did like this video, please hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you're already a subscriber, then hit that little bell in the corner to be informed as soon as Digital Foundry posts a video. If you want to help us out, support Digital Foundry on Patreon to get this content in high quality for download and also years of our content in high quality for download as well as talk to us on discord and as always follow us all on twitter and this is alex bring you auf wiedersehen und, und?